Three, one, two, three, testing. Hello, hello. I think I hear you. Good morning. What a lively room this morning. I'm sorry to interrupt so many conversations, but it's time to worship. If you are visiting us today, we are so glad you are here. We have a friendship register in each row. If you could take a moment and fill out your name, and if you write legibly your email address, we will be in touch with you. If you don't, and you don't hear from us, that means we couldn't read it. So, do your best. We are so glad that you are all here worshiping with us this morning. I have a few quick announcements, and then we will get going. First of all, as you can see, I'm holding our blue bag, and it is the day to pick up your blue bag for our food drive. Bring it back next Sunday, full of goodies for the Coconut Grove Crisis Food Pantry, and we will get it all delivered over there. Next week is also the uh, collection for the this and that shop, so if you're doing that spring cleaning, bring your stuff over in front of McNaughton Hall, and we would be glad to take it off your hands. Um, also, next Sunday, it's a busy Sunday. I'm just going to set this down. Uh, we have a planned giving workshop that is right after worship over in Plymouth Hall. There are goodies. You can come and learn all about how you can leave a legacy here at Plymouth. So we invite everyone to come over. It should be a very interesting conversation led by um, Lou Nostro. So also a couple other things. Yesterday we had our second annual golf tournament and we can see our... Uh, trophies over here, and I just have to say thank you to all who participated. Thank you to all of those, especially Nick Smith, who I know is on a cruise right now, but getting some much needed rest for all of the hard work putting that together, and a little bit of a quick moment of congratulations to our defending champion, Donna Fales. <laughs> Who was also nice enough to remember to bring these for me since I trusted her to remember them more than I trusted myself today. So thank you and congratulations. Um, our youth group, we have both middle school and high school youth group tonight. We are going to be doing a service project where we are going to be putting together welcome bags and summer bags. Um, and so we will meet in Davis Hall. We would love to have middle school at five, high school at six. And finally, my last big push announcement is for our summer high school youth mission trip. We have a hard deadline of tomorrow. Unfortunately, we planned this kind of late in the game since I had just started this last August, but we are excited to be going to Orlando. And so if you are currently in eighth grade through 12th grade, we would love, love, love to have you join us June 9th through the 14th. We're going to go up to Orlando. We're going to serve with Serve Orlando, doing lots of different things. So we will be working with kids or in a garden or painting a house or serving in a soup kitchen. It's going to be a great experience for all who go. So see me or Moira. If you have any questions, text me, call me. Registration deadline is tomorrow. All right. On that note. Let us switch gears. Let us take a deep breath. Let us be in the spirit of worship, inviting the holy to be among us. Let us worship together.
our bulletins and after that great hymn, call one another to worship. Come into God's presence with songs of hope. Let us sing of God's saving grace. God's promises are steadfast. Be strong and take heart. Let us worship the Lord. Please be seated. Let us join one another in our prayer of invocation and our Lord's prayer. Lord of life and light, your will for us is gracious. You know our fears. We seek assurance of your grace. We long to trust deeply in your presence. You have promised to abide among us. As we worship, may we open our hearts and abide with you. May we not only see your goodness, but nurture and share it with a wounded world. We ask these things in the name of our risen Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> First lesson this morning is a responsorial psalm. And you think all you had to do was watch TV last night while you're making dinner. And we can feel besieged that there is so much turmoil and conflict and wickedness. Uh, in the world. And yet we are called to be people of hope and w use the words that Jesus says in our text this morning, saying, peace be with you. And that, com that peace comes often at great cost. So we turn to God when we are in these places of turmoil. So I invite us together to say this psalm as a reminder that yes, there is turmoil in the world, but so is God. Psalm 27, selected verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against, to, against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh boy, oh there we are, okay. I was like, me and microphones are not getting along here lately. I invite my young friends to come and join me up front. Don't be shy. Come on up, come on up. We're gonna talk a little bit. Well, here comes someone not being shy. Woo, let's go. <laughs> oh boy, so much energy. <laughs> Give me some of that. Look at our new shoes. You got some new shoes? Great, yeah. awesome, love them. All right, I was thinking, I was like, you know, this job of, uh, being faithful and believing in God, this is like, this is hard work. This is not an easy thing. And then as a teacher and as our preachers, it's like we're, we're trying to help you make sense of all these words and things that we find in the Bible. And what does it mean and how is that gonna help you learn and grow? Well, one thing I thought about is that we have all these people out here. Look at all these people out here. They all have a story. Something happened to them in their life, and then they had this spirit that was within them that we call God, right, that, that helps them get through it. 
helps us face whatever it is that we think is about to happen, right? So this morning, I was looking through our, our bulletin, and there were a couple of words that jumped out at me. One is this word salvation. We're always talking about salvation. And as a kid, I bet you you're wondering, like, what is that? Does that mean I'm going to the junkyard and find some stuff and bring it home? And, or am I going to stop while I'm driving my car along the road? My dad used to do that a lot. People's garbage was his salvation. He would pick up stuff and bring it home, and my mother was like, oh, boy, again. But he would turn it into very useful stuff. The other word is witness. Witness. Now, you might not, I know you guys play some games sometimes about witnessing, maybe, uh, but like to be a witness is like to tell the truth, right? To, to tell about something that you saw, something that happened. And if you're in a court of law, they say, now look, just, we just want the facts. Tell us the facts, like what actually happened. Don't tell us what you think happened, what actually happened. So these are two important words. In, in, with our faith. And so witness means that you're going to tell the stories about what happened in your life and how you got through it. And sometimes maybe it was a sad thing that you got through or maybe something very happy, you know, oh wow, I was praying that I would make the soccer team and oh, I made it, I'm so happy. Uh, so that's telling your story, witnessing. And then salvation, uh, you know, we always talk about God promised us salvation. Jesus died on the cross for our salvation, right? So what did Jesus do? Yes, Jesus died on the cross, and we're in this Easter season where we know there was the resurrection and Jesus lives. So what does that mean for your little lives today? What it means is that you can tell your stories and that Jesus promised that there's nothing too bad that you could do that God won't still love you, that you will always have God with you and help you through it. You'll always have all these people, all these faces sitting out here helping you through it if you're lost, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling happy, if you bring your lovely little stuffies to church, all these people will always believe in you, support you, and say, keep going, keep going. And you will always witness, and that means that you're always going to tell the stories about how God is working in your life as you understand it today. So I'm going to end with a quick little story I was thinking about. I, I, I'm a preschool teacher. I teach here in our preschool, and I teach little three-year-olds. And so I was thinking, this week, I, I, I've, you know, we go over what the safety rules are and what you should do. So I, I have a kid in my class that every time they see, to, oh, Mrs. Burt, they're, 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 they have their feet in the chair. Remember, we're supposed to sit tall when we're at the snack table. Oh, Mrs. Burt, they were burning using their walking feet, not using their walking feet. We're supposed to use our walking feet, right? And so I remember he was just constantly reminding me and reminding his classmates of what to do to be doing the right thing, to keep everybody safe and to, so that everybody can have a good time. So that's what it means for us to witness and to have salvation. And boy, aren't we lucky. Look, I want you to look at these faces. Stand up and look at all these faces out here and wave at them. No, come on, help me. Okay, I'll stand up too. Hi. See? And they're waving back because they care about us. And they're going to tell us the stories, and they're going to be our witnesses, and we're going to be their witnesses. Let's say a little prayer before we go off to Nurturing Faith. Okay. Gracious God, we thank you so much for teaching us these words, witness and salvation. And as we grow, we will learn more and more of what they mean. And we thank you for all the people sitting out here who will help us keep those promises that we try to make to be kind and helpful to one another. Amen. Amen. Off to Nurturing Faith.
Our text today for the second reading begins in the middle of the 24th chapter of Luke. And right before this, there had been an encounter with Jesus by two followers along the road to Emmaus, where Jesus appeared before them. And so where we pick up in our passage today is that a group of 11 disciples and some others, and then these two unnamed followers are talking about what's been happening. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself, and touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while, their jo while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and they ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to all of these things. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
As we reflect on your word, open our hearts so that we might embrace your call to us. Guide us to live out your gospel in all the ways that we are meant to. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Imagine with me for a moment, it has been a long and stressful week. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced that, so I know you're going to have to dig deep to understand this. All you want is the weekend, and it's finally Friday night, and you want to go home, kick back, and relax. But, suddenly... At the last minute, you realize you are supposed to be headed to a dinner party. You're tired and not really in the mood for it, but you pull yourself together and you head out. Even though you aren't excited about being there, you arrive at the party and you begin to work the room, catching up with friends and people you know, trying your best to make the most of a night out. Suddenly, an unexpected guest walks into the party, and there is almost a collective gasp in the room at the shock of it. This is not just any guest, but this is one that you have followed on the news for weeks and months. Their trials and triumphs feel as close to your heart as your very own. You can hardly believe that you are in the same room. You are so grateful you went out tonight. In fact, if you weren't there witnessing this with your own eyes, you might not believe it even happened, that they even would walk into a place where you might be. I imagine this scene to be much like what the disciples' gathering must have been like. They're exhausted. It's been a long week. There's been a lot going on. And now they're hearing about all these things in the whirlwind of events that have unfolded. Jesus' death, his resurrection, reports of an empty tomb. And now there's whispers that he's been showing up along the road meeting people. I can imagine that would be a little bit surprising, exhausting, and daunting. And then, all of a sudden, in the midst of their conversations, Jesus appears at their little party, at their little gathering. And they too are rather shocked. In their initial shock and joy, it echoes around the room. It's almost funny. They should have probably been expecting this. And Jesus realizes that they're stunned and tries to soothe over the startle in the room with his words. Peace be with you. Still in a bit of shock, the disciples instead think they're seeing a ghost. They're really good at that doubting thing. Well, recognizing their doubts and seeing the fear on their faces, Jesus decides that maybe if he lets them touch him, they'll suddenly believe that it is indeed him standing there. But as always, it takes just a little more convincing. And so now to prove his full humanness, he asks for something to eat. He eats a piece of broiled fish. I gotta say, if that's the first food I'm eating, I'm not asking for fish. I'm thinking a bowl of ice cream or something really decadent and chocolatey. But hey, to each their own. Regardless of the food choice, by eating, he is trying to bridge this gap between divine and human, between death and life, that he is really sitting right there among them. (coughs) And finally, that does the trick. 
His reassurances transform their fear into joy, their, bewil their bewilderment into wonder. And that, my friends, sets the stage for the next part. You see, there's a big reveal at the very end of this passage, a mission that he's been sort of waiting to like throw at them. It's the last line of the passage where it says, you are witnesses of these things. Now, when we just read this, we might not even catch that that has any significance at all. But if we really stop and focus for a minute and look at those words, we realize that he has given them a job. He doesn't ask if they want it. He doesn't really give them a choice. He just comes in, proves who he is, gets their fears cal calmed down, and then he lays it on them. And he says, I got a job for you. You are witnesses, like it or not. Just like Andre was just talking about. When you're a witness, you're called to testify about something that you have seen, that you have experienced, that you have witnessed. And that's what he wants from them. He wants them to testify about what has happened. The they are barely over their shock, and now they have to do something more. They have to go out and share about all of this. Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's time for you to get to work. He doesn't sugarcoat it for him. He doesn't ease him into it. He sort of just shows up and says, okay, time to go. The disciples had witnessed his entire ministry and life, his death and now his resurrection. And after all of that, with barely a minute to catch their breath, it's time for them to go tell the story. You have watched, you have listened, you have journeyed with me, and now it's your turn. It's your turn to go out and live according to what I have lived like. It is time for you to go tell others about me. It is time that you live a life that reflects what I have been teaching you. It's go time. Author J. Randolph Taylor in the book, The Most Important Thing, I want to quote this one little piece of his book that he says, Without the resurrection, there would be no story. The evidence for the resurrection is not just an empty tomb. The real evidence is the women and men who meet the risen Christ, who witnessed his resurrection within their own lives. None of the New Testament would have been written, shared, or preserved apart from that. They remembered, thought of, loved, and wrote about a Christ who was dead and is now alive. The encounters the disciples had with Jesus changed them. It was transformative. Life could not just go back to normal after that. It's not like you can just see something this amazing and then just go, yeah, I'm going to go home and watch a rerun of Friends or something. It's not how that works. We are changed. It seeps into us. And so they did exactly what Jesus asked. They got to work telling others about it. We know this because we're sitting here right now talking about it. We have read about it. We have heard about it because they did their job. We know Peter, who was once a simple fisherman, transformed into a bold preacher. We know that the disciples went on to tell the story. And from generation to generation, it was passed down to this moment where we're standing and sitting right here. It doesn't stop there, though. We, too, are witnesses. And we, too have a job to do. We have work ahead of us. We know and have read all the stories of Jesus' life and ministry. We know of his death and resurrection. We know all of it through the eyes of those who came before us. 
It's not enough that the tomb is empty. It's not enough for us to proclaim on Easter morning, Christ is risen, and then go back to normal life. We too have been changed. We too have been transformed because of who Jesus was and what he did for us. And now we have to be witnesses, like it or not, just like the disciples. Now I know as I was listening to Andrea do the children's moment, I kind of peeked at some faces. And when we hear the word witness, I think we get a little uncomfortable. We kind of bristle against that because it either one means we're going to court and that's probably a little scary, at least for everybody that's not a lawyer in the room. And we've also kind of gotten a bad taste in our mouth about the whole concept of witnessing to Christ. Well, the word has gotten a bad rap because we witness all the time, whether we realize it or not. We tell others about the things that we experience and the things that happen in our lives every single day. We tell others about our favorite vacations or even our favorite restaurants. We aren't shy about sharing our experiences on a mission trip or serving at Chapman or painting a house for rebuilding together. But when it comes time to talk about our faith, we get a little shy. We get a little timid. You see, we have no problem talking to friends and family or even the stranger sitting next to us on an airplane about a big life event that has occurred, a wedding, moving, having a baby, losing a loved one, those are easy to talk about. But we get a bit tongue-tied when we have to talk about Jesus or church or our faith. But I'm here to tell you, you do not have to be a preacher to witness. You do not have to stand up here at this pulpit and give a sermon to be able to be a witness. You do not even have to go to a courtroom and sit in a stand and tell of Jesus there. You can do it in your everyday life, not with words, but with how you live. Our actions speak louder than our words more often than not. We don't have to be like Peter talking to the crowds. Instead, we can witness with the small decisions and choices that we make each and every day. Like when we treat others with kindness, we are witnessing what we learned from Jesus. When we provide for those in need with clothes and food and water, we are loving just like Jesus did. Not all of us use our words to be witnesses, but all of us can use our actions our daily living to model his love to those around us. When we live a life of transformation because of how we have been changed, others take notice. Because we are changed by every experience that we encounter throughout our lives. I want to tell you a story of one of the most profound experiences that has ever changed me and that I have had the privilege of witnessing how love has changed someone else. It was back in 2011 and I was preparing for a summer mission trip. Hmm, seems familiar. Well, there was a youth that summer, that spring that I had been trying to encourage to go on this mission trip. We were headed to Colorado and even though she was reluctant, she finally willingly decided to go. She was great on that trip. She served the kids we worked with with such joy and compassion, maybe even more so than the ones that were really excited to be on that trip. She engaged with the rest of the group and seemed to enjoy every moment, which of course was the hope all along, right? Well, a few weeks after we got back, She came to me and she told me that that mission trip had saved her life. I looked at her rather confused. 
I didn't know what she was talking about. So she went on and told me that she had been really struggling before that trip. In fact, school had been so rough and family life had been so hard that she was planning her to end her life that summer. It was the experience on that mission trip that saved her. When she got home, she no longer wanted to end her life. She wanted to witness the transformation. She had been changed through the experience of serving others, of living like Jesus taught us, by doing the things that he told us to do. I will never forget that moment. You see, experiencing God's love, being a witness to its transforming power is something we just can't keep to ourselves. Our lives need to speak of the hope and joy we witness on Easter morning. Jesus placed a big responsibility on our shoulders. It's our responsibility to continue to love others unconditionally. It is our responsibility to stand against injustice. It is our responsibility to serve those in need. It is our responsibility to care for the hurting. It is our job to spread hope where despair swells. It is our job to speak with compassion. It is our job to speak peace in the midst of chaos and destruction. It is our job to welcome the stranger with open arms. It is not merely enough to exist alongside others. We must actively engage in embodying Christ's love in the world. That is what it means to be witnesses of these things. That's it. That's the job. It's go time. We're witnesses, like it or not. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, show your mercy upon us. O oh God, make clean our hearts within us. Eternal God, your love is steadfast. Your promises are sure. Our love, our promises can waver. And so we seek your face. As we join our hearts in prayer, fill us with assurance of your grace. May you become the stronghold of our life and the wellspring of our faith. Servant Savior, risen Savior, you call us to be a servant people, raising us to new hope and life you call us to become witnesses to your presence in the world, embodying your grace, extending your hand of mercy. Our spirits can be overcome 
doubts arise in our hearts, thoughts overwhelm our minds. Spirit of hope and health, in great and small ways, we can feel that wickedness is having its way in the world. In places of terror and turmoil, too numerous to name, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, and shield your people from despair. We do abide in your loving care. Moment by moment, we do ask that your spirit fall afresh upon us. Open our souls. May we receive and be renewed by your blessings that the world might see a glimmer of your goodness in us, receive a measure of your kindness through us. May we abide in grace with one another. May our lips speak words of encouragement, words that help and heal. We do pray for those who are in particular need. May no one, no one who walks the earth feel alone. The power of your love, may we be strong and take heart. We pray for Angelica and William, Bruce and Martha, Terry, Christine, Mary Rogers and Linda Long, Barbara, Melanie, and the family of Tabitha Day. Living God, you are always near. Quiet our minds. That in a sacred moment, we might know what it is to stop and to wait to wait upon you and grant us deep trust. Lord of light and salvation, you came to us, lived with us, and died for us to call us to repentance, to offer us forgiveness. You rose again saying, peace be with you. Words of hope and challenge. You send us out to share this story, this blessing with a wounded world. Let us not grow weary, but fill us with compassionate strength. Each moment of each day is filled with possibility for good or ill. In all our variety, may we sing a new song for your people. Many hearts, many melodies in the harmony of faithful hope, a communion of faithful hearts, a beautiful and sacred gift to you. (coughs) Amen. In all the ways that we make our decisions and all the actions that we have and the words that come from our mouth, the thoughts of our minds, we are called to witness. That can be a challenge. It can be a particular challenge when you're struggling. I think all of us together, 
we come to church. I have people who won't come sometimes because they'll say, I'm just going to cry. I'm having such a hard time. And I would say nobody has ever put their rear end on a pew at Plymouth Church who hasn't struggled with something. Come and let us witness as a place to be when you are weak and when you need to cry. We have Kleenex. Being together and being a community where people who are struggling with something hard can come together and worship and hear you all sing for them, that is a witness. People in this congregation struggle. We talked the other day, the tour buses that come by and the people that get out to take the pictures and they think, what a wonderful place. People in this church must just be, have such wonderful lives. I look out at your faces on Sunday and sometimes it makes me want to weep when I know what's going on in your lives. The witness of being faithful people together is so powerful. That is one of the greatest blessings we can give to one another. What we get by that, being the, that group of people where we can come and be weak is the power to be strong and to be compassionate and to reach out into the community. And we do that with our hands and we do that with our gifts. The gifts we give are a witness to the people who can't be in here with us. Some of them are watching online. Some of them are just out there in the community struggling and you know all the ways, you can read all the ways that we do that. It is in gratitude that we can put something in that plate, whether you've done it online or however you do it. That offering of physical, tangible hope is a great privilege to be able to offer. Gratefully, the morning offering will now be received.
Gracious God, with grateful hearts, we give thanks for these gifts. May you bless them and multiply them. May they be used for your witnessing in our world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. to be witness. Let's go and witness. May the words of our mouth, may the actions of our feet and hands serve those who need us. May our love surround those who are lonely. And may in all we do and say, we be pleasing to God. Amen. You may be seated. Mm -hmm. 